All right, so welcome to the February 25th session for our class. If we're disconnect, disconnected for more than 10 minutes or so, please check on Canvas a little bit later today for the information that we would have covered. So at this time, let's do an attendance check, please. Uh, please type present for your attendance in chat. If you did not sign in with your full name, be sure to include it in the message. I'll try to remind myself to uh, make this announcement again a little bit later in the presentation since others may join us after we begin. Okay, let's go ahead and begin the session today. All right. So as we've done so far this semester, we'll start off by looking at what we covered in the last session. In the last session, we began our conversation on developmental psychology or developing across the lifespan. So we looked at prenatal development and newborn. We started off with the idea of conception, where the sperm and egg form the zygote and they become fertilized. Then we looked at prenatal development of the zygote and the embryo. The zygote will last about 10 to, 10 to 14 days. The embryo is the next part of this process for two to eight weeks. Uh, during this time, the embryo forms organs and bones. The fetus is going to occur around nine weeks after this. And then we have hands and face and other features start to form that look very much like humans. Now, we also discussed at this time, too, those particular issues that can be problematic in the development of an uh, unborn child. Those are tetrogens. These tetrogens are going to be certain like viruses and chemicals that can have an impact on the development of this unborn child. One such instance is going to be the FAS or fetal alcohol syndrome. So when the mother continues to drink uh, during her pregnancy, this can sometimes disrupt the normal developmental process of that unborn child, causing all sorts of particular issues in the body, the brain, facial features, and things of that nature. We then talked about what happens when the baby is born, when they become a newborn. We're not born totally helpless. We have certain skill sets that we're born with. These are sort of described as reflexes, the rooting reflex, the sucking reflex, and also crying are tools that we employ very early in our life in order for us to get fed, as well as to tell people who take care of us that we need some attention. We then moved on to infancy and childhood. We looked at the idea of maturation, which is this unfolding sequence of events that naturally occurs as we develop. We also talked about infantile amnesia and how it has a certain impact on our, our memory. The idea here is that when we are three years old or younger, we don't have, for example, the same memory systems in place as we do as adults. So because of this incompatibility between uh, an adult memory system and uh, three years and younger memory system, we don't have access to the memories that we may have produced when we're that young. So we can't remember when we we're one year old or two year old. If you do recall anything from that time frame in your life, most likely it is a fabricated memory, meaning you heard the story told so often about when you were younger that you created a memory to fill in that sort of gap. But the infantile amnesia exists primarily because the brain is not fully formed yet. And that's going to be a uh, particular interest because of the hippocampus. As we've learned already, the hippocampus has a critical role in forming memories. Because it's not fully formed or developed yet, then of course, it's going to be an issue with developing memories at a very young age. Then we start talking about Piaget, Jean Piaget and his idea of cognitive development. He was very interested in how young people think. He realized that young people don't think the same way as adults do. So he developed as this theory as to how we do learn to think. He came up with the idea of a schema. And a schema is basically a, a framework that we can have to uh, categorize and, and sort of uh, put in the nice little slots our experiences to day-to-day -to -day life. So we meet something, we experience something, and we may develop a schema, sort of a network of information about that particular item that, that came to our, our, our view in, in, in our life. So when we have this schema, the schema can then be uh, changed. For example, we can have an assimilation of a new event that we include something into a schema that we already have. Or we may accommodate, meaning that we may change a schema or develop a new schema for new information in our world. 
So obviously when we develop a schema, for example, on dog, and then we see a cat, we may have to adjust our schema or just call them pets, all right, as a starting a new schema. So we have dogs and cats part of this schema for pets. Then we went and talked a little bit about some social aspects of our development. Now, up here at the very top, we see the, the categories of Piaget's uh, development. We see sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and so on. And we covered the first three of those in the last session. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the last one, formal operational, today. So the social aspects of, of development looks at attachment styles. And attachment style is basically, uh, there was a study done by uh, Mary Ainsworth that looked at the strange situation scenario. And in this particular uh, situation, you would have a mother and child come to a strange room, and then the mother would get up and leave. And they were interested to see how the child responded and, and acted when the mother left and when the mother returned. This way, they were able to determine the type of attachment style that the kid had. Was it a secure attachment style? Meaning that they felt trusting of the mother that the mother would come back if she walked away from them? Or was it an insecure attachment style where they either were very upset when the mother left and were upset with them when she returned or they sort of avoided her, okay? And sort of gave her the cold shoulder when she left and also when she returned. So one key thing that we pointed out last time too as well is that these attachment styles that we develop when we are younger, they also have a possible impact on our adult relationships. So we may have somebody who had an insecure attachment style as they were young and as an adult, they may demonstrate some of those type of behaviors. For example, always knowing, wanting to know where their spouse is or their significant other. Then we talked about temperaments. These are the things that are already in us because we see them so early in our life that we believe that temperaments we come in with certain temperaments already so we're born with them you can have the easygoing uh, baby or the very difficult baby the easygoing baby they sleep at regular schedules uh, loud noises do not upset them and cause them to cry and the exact opposite happens when we have a difficult baby a small noise gets them all bother and they cry all the time or they don't have regular sleep and feeding schedules so they can be termed difficult and then we ended up talking about parenting styles the idea that parenting styles can have a great deal of impact on a child as well and the notion is we got to understand too that it's bi-directional that kids and kids personality types too will also potentially influence the type of parenting style the parent the child may have and the three styles that we looked at were authoritative authoritarian and permissive and we usually see authoritative, uh, setting structure, setting rules, but allowing uh, the, the child to learn a little bit and to express themselves somewhat is the best style overall for the young person. All right, so those were the key items that we covered during our last session. So today, we start by talking about adolescence. Now, adolescence is somewhat of a new idea or concept and what it really represents is a bubble of protection around a certain age group to allow them the opportunity, the time to grow, to learn, to get educated uh, before they become an adult and have a lot more adult type responsibilities. So adolescence is something that we see in modern era. Uh, hundreds of years ago, we probably didn't see this thing like adolescence because it wasn't the same type of thing. When you were really, really young, you could have started going to work when you're 10, 12 years old, okay? Because you had the ability to do some stuff back then, uh, manual labor, those types of things. But as modern times came about and we developed uh, this desire to make things easier for our offspring, adolescence did develop. So what is this adolescence? We'll be looking at that as we go through these next few slides. So some of the topics we'll be looking at will be physical development, puberty, and more. Cognitive development in adolescence, reasoning power, moral intuition, uh, social development in adolescence, forming identity, parent and peer relationships, and this new idea, something we refer to as emerging adulthood. Okay, so let's begin. Developmental psychologists used to focus attention primarily on the childhood. They saw that as the primary way that we see our development occur during our childhood years. But now we have more of a lifespan perspective because life is a long process and development is a long process, a lifelong one. Uh, 
So this refers to the idea that development is indeed a lifelong process. It's not just delegated to one particular phase in our life, childhood. So this next phase of that process is adolescence. And this is a transition period from childhood to adulthood. The period of development ranging from puberty to independence. So puberty, as we'll see, is about you becoming capable of reproducing and independence about you being able to stand on your own two feet, so to speak, without having to have the needs for others to support you in some manner. So the picture to the left here says, are these kids adolescents yet? Well, there's gonna be a lot of flex because you can look at two adolescents and they'll look totally different. You can have a young adolescent and you can have an old adolescent. An older adolescent may be in their 20s. So the notion here when it comes to adolescence, it is a rather long period and you can look quite different and still be an adolescent. So let's look at adolescent physical development. First, we start off with puberty. Now, puberty is the time of sexual maturation, becoming physically able to participate in reproduction. That's all it really means. You are now an adult from the, from the notion that you can participate in the cycles of reproduction. So during puberty, we have these increased sex hormones that lead to primary and secondary sex characteristics. The primary sex characteristics are characteristics which are involved directly in reproduction. Secondary sex characteristics are those which are not directly involved in reproduction, but may be utilized to help identify one member as belonging to one sex as opposed to another. There are gonna be some changes in mood and behavior. And as with other maturation, the sequence is more predictable than the timing. So it may begin for some much earlier than others. Okay, so that can be somewhat more flexible, but the sequence of events, how it really carries out is gonna be the same. So that's what matur maturation seems to sort of dictate to us. So now, of course, some people will develop sooner than others. That's what timing is suggesting that they may become, begin the maturation process earlier. All right. So boys who become strong and athletic and have early physical maturation, they usually become very popular. They're usually more confident. Okay. They are at greater risk, however, of substance abuse, delinquency, as well as premature sexual activity. Girls whose bodies mature early may associate with older teens or be teased or taunted quite a bit. So obviously one of the things that we see is that early maturation is not necessarily a positive thing. There are gonna be certain aspects that people may appreciate, but again, you can have physical maturation, but no emotional maturation at all. Now, one of the key things that I think I've emphasized a couple of times already, particularly in chapter two, is the adolescent brain development. What it comes down to is that during puberty, the brain stops automatically adding new connections and starts pruning away the neurons and synapses that aren't being used. Okay, so that use them or lose them type of scenario. The frontal lobes are still forming during this time, still becoming more efficient at conducting signals. And as we've talked about before, the frontal lobes is where we have inhibition control. So we have things that sort of slow us down, uh, make us think about something that we may be doing by inhibiting us. But when we're really young, a young adolescent, we don't have those fully online yet. So the adolescent brain is at its peak for learning ability, but not fully able to inhibit impulses. So the idea here is really, in this next phrase really takes care of it. It says, we have a good accelerator, like a good drive pedal, uh, but we have bad brakes. So we can get going and doing a lot of stuff, but the things that slow us down are not fully formed yet. That's the inhibition control that we normally see in the frontal lobe. So as this cartoon uh, sort of suggests here in the caption, young man, go to your room and stay until your frontal lobes finish forming. The idea is that until that, that frontal lobe fully forms, you will be a lot more risk taking, a lot more devil may care, okay? And that can be somewhat problematic. People can get themselves in situations that it would be good to have inhibition in, uh, but 
they don't currently have it. Their brain is not fully formed yet in that area that will allow us to have greater inhibition. So when we look at uh, adolescent cognitive development, we, we see that according to Jean Piaget, adolescents are in the formal operation stage. Again, uh, I have this uh, at the bottom of this slide, you see it about 12 through adulthood. This is the formal operational stage. And here we have the ability to do abstract reasoning abstract logic, okay, potential for mature moral reasoning. So at this particular stage, we are displaying uh, characteristics of adultness in many ways. So we can think about how reality compares to our ideals, think hypothetically about different choices and their consequences, critique the reasoning of others so you can start to be somewhat judgy on other people and critique how they're thinking and what their reasoning is for certain things and their behavior. And we can debate matters of justice, meaning of life, and human nature, okay? Now, the key thing too we should also note is that they may tend to ignore consequences and focus on the benefits of risky behavior. So sometimes you do something risky and there may be a great outcome for it but you may overemphasize the great outcome for the risky behavior and underemphasize the potential dangerous risk of it. So again, this goes with that frontal lobe thing that we talked about a second ago, is that the frontal lobe, the inhibition isn't there yet uh, when we look at this adolescent cognitive development, and that can get us into some really sticky situations uh, for young people. Now, this next few slides deal with uh, morality. All right, you know, so when we look at morality, building toward moral reasoning, and this is another thing too that we see as a characteristic of, of the growing adolescents. Adolescents see justice and fairness in terms of merit and equity instead of in terms of everyone getting equal treatment. Now, one way you could say people should always be treated, just treat everybody equally. Okay, that seems fair at a certain of the, a stage of development, but at this stage, adolescents have a little bit more sharper reasoning skills. Okay, they understand that justice and fairness may be done based on merit and equity instead of in terms of everyone getting equal treatment. Sounds a little bit weird, but think about what that means. Uh, someone who does something for uh, does something wrong for the right reasons, may not be treated the same one who did something wrong for the wrong reason. So the idea here is they're taking a fine tooth comb, to, so to speak, to a lot of understanding the social arena by understanding that morality uh, does not, is not black and white, so to speak. So moral intuition is our reasoning may be directed by our emotions such as discussed about evil acts. You can be very upset about something that someone does that you think is just evil and inappropriate, okay? We also see it can elevate us to feel really great about things, uh, elevated feelings about generosity and courage when you see those examples out in the world. So we, we are fine-tuned, we've grown uh, in this instance uh, at a very moral level. Now, this morality took some time for us to develop it. Now, uh, Kohlberg developed this levels of moral reasoning. And so he says there were certain stages that we go through. And let's look at these stages real quickly. We have the pre-conventional morality. This is for everyone up to around age nine. So anyone at nine or above, they don't have pre-conventional morality. Anyone below nine has pre-conventional morality. Here, we follow the rules because if you don't, you'll get in trouble. If you do, you might get a treat. So what is right and wrong, what is moral, is more about receiving punishment and rewards. So there's no highfalutin, higher principles involved in it whatsoever. It's about what you get out of it, getting something good or getting something bad. So it's very pre-conventional morality. So not really sophisticated. Then we have conventional morality. This is what we normally see during early adolescence. You follow the rules, because we get along better if everyone does the right thing. So these are gonna be those, those adolescents who, for example, are the rule followers. For example, even when you're playing a game, well, the rules don't say that. We gotta follow the rules because the rules help us avoid chaos, 
okay? And that's one of the things that they see as the right thing to do. Follow the rules because we get along better if everyone does the right thing. Very conventional morality. And then we have the final stage here, post-conventional morality. This is gonna be when we say late adolescence or adulthood. Sometimes rules need to be set aside to pursue higher principles. So this could even read laws should be set aside or broken for a higher principle to be met. So if you see something that's wrong, you go out and protest it. If you see something that's wrong, you may even do things that will be legally against the law because you don't believe in them. You think it's morally wrong for this to be a law on the books. So at the stage of later adolescence and adulthood, you have the ability to think this way. Someone who is eight years old, they won't think that way. They'll be still in that pre-conventional morality. That's the thing that's gonna drive them. I'm gonna pause real quickly here to see if there are any questions or comments. I've been going at a quick clip here. So uh, are there any comments or questions or clarification you guys need so far? Uh, you can send me a chat message or just speak up. I'll take a sip of my drink here and wait and see if there's a response to that. Okay, we all seem good. All right, cool. So what we've done so far then, we've talked about this moral reasoning and we've talked about Kohlberg's stages of morality and what age group we tend to see these different types of morality in play. Now, sometimes, I don't have the slides this time, but sometimes we can see uh, different rationale for certain types of uh, illegal behavior, for example. For example, doing natural disasters like a, a, a hurricane or a great power outage or a flood or something. It's not unusual to see people uh, break into stores and take things, loot things, okay? Uh, the idea is that, well, what is this? If you're operating at a post-conventional morality, some of the things that you may be taking may be seen as okay, because maybe there is a higher principle at play here. For example, let's say someone is dying in your home from some sort of uh, infection. You can't get to the hospital. Hospitals are sort of shut down and out of reach. You know, there's a drugstore somewhere and you break into the drugstore and you take the drugs that would probably be suited for that particular ailment. Well, is that wrong? At some level, yeah, you broke the law. But at another level, would it be okay if you had something that you could do and just let the person die? So again, this is the type of stuff that people can sort of judge based on what their actions are and where they are when it comes to morality, why they're doing the things that they're doing. Now, obviously, if you ask someone uh, pre-conventional morality, uh, their main thing would be, does the person get caught or not? So if the person gets caught, then that was wrong. If they don't get caught, then we're just fine. That's pre-conventional morality. So we can see how we can judge many types of actions and behaviors based on where we fall and the type of morality uh, according to Cole's work level of moral reasoning. Now, when it comes to moral action, uh, moral action is what you're going to do, doing the right thing. And so it starts off with character education. What helps people choose principled actions over selfishness or social pressure? So people can do things that are gonna be wrong, okay, the wrong thing to do because they're selfish and they want something or they're conforming and social pressure is causing them to act in a certain way. For example, you're with a group of kids and you are a good kid normally. You're, uh, let's say in high school or junior high and uh, you're with the cool kids and you're considered to be a cool kid enough that they hang out with you. And then they start bullying another kid. Well, what do you do? Do you stand up for the rights of that other kid? You may feel really bad that this other kid's getting bullied, but you know, if you do that type of thing, it may come back on you. All right. So we have selfishness to try to avoid them, you being ostracized yourself. And social pressure, you don't want people to give you that those cold stares when you try to start to defend the person they're bullying. So what goes into this character education? Well, first we have empathy for the feelings of others. Can you relate to that kid that's getting bullied? Can you see it from their perspective? Also self-discipline 
or the ability to resist impulses. You may want something, but you can delay it. You don't have to do it now, okay? You have self discipline to control yourself. And then we have delaying gratification, okay? Uh, one of the things too, you do the right thing. Sometimes people want things when they want them, but if you can delay gratification to achieve a larger goal, a larger plan, that is saying a lot about your ability to do the right thing. And then experience serving others, the greater good. I do this thing because it's good for society for me to do this type of thing, to help this person out. So all these things are sort of factors that go into playing uh, what you're going to do, moral action. So you may think things, but do you have the ability to act on these moral things that you're thinking about? Can you act? And by having all these factors in play, you're more likely to have moral action in place. So that tells us a little bit about morality and how morality has a great deal of impact on us when we're in this later adolescent and young adulthood years. I mean, normally this is the time when people at college where you got most of you guys are now, uh, you feel very connected and you want to stand up for the right thing and for people to do the right thing. And, and usually this winds up going out to go protest and joining certain types of causes. That's what we normally see. That's what we normally see during this particular age group, uh, late adolescents and young adulthood. They're joiners, they're protesters. They're going to stand up for causes that they truly believe in. Next, we start talking about Eric Erickson. I, I like Eric Erickson's uh, uh, theory here and his approach to many things. Uh, he developed this psychosocial stages of development, okay? And so let's talk about them before you see the uh, actual uh, stages here. Each age involves an issue, a psychological challenge in managing our interaction with the social world. So his was social factors, uh, Jean Piaget, his was more about cognitive factors. So here we're talking about social factors. So there's gonna be an issue at each one of his stages, an issue, a challenge for the person. Each stage, each stage that he has too will have a versus in it. So basically there'll be a tension between two opposing tendencies. So there'll be an issue and then there'll be one option and then another option, but these two options will be totally opposed to each other. So basically it's saying you have this issue, you can solve it one way or the other way. One of these two opposing tendencies. And then successfully resolving this tension gives us strengths that help us move to the next stage. So when you resolve a particular stage in this uh, approach, it prepares you for the next stage in your stage of social development. Not resolving this tension can lead to lifelong emotional and social difficulties. All right, so let's talk to some extent about Eric Erickson and where he sees us uh, doing the stage of adolescent, adolescence, what's going on. So per Eric Erickson's social development approach, the model of lifelong psychosocial development sees adolescence as a struggle to form an identity a sense of self. This is gonna be the time frame when young people may try out a different, different roles or different types of identities. They try to fill, find the one that fits best for them. So they may dye their hair, they may get all sorts of piercings, they may have different contact lenses, they may get earrings, they may do many things as they try to find that identity that fits for them. So. Adolescents may try these different roles with peers, with parents, and with teachers as they try out these different selves. For Erickson, the challenge in adolescence is to test and integrate these roles or selves in order to pre prevent role confusion. So ultimately, you go through a variety of stages as an adolescent. And as you get closer and closer to late adolescence, and closer and closer to young adulthood, you take all those roles that you have experienced, all those various things that you did, those types of things that you tried out, those different cells, and you integrate them all. You integrate them all to make you, the new you, that has certain characteristics from the time when you dyed your hair, from when you wore different co colored contact lenses, from when you did these piercings or got these tattoos. But it is the new you. When you have that new identity, the one that you settle on and say, this is me, this 
helps you to avoid role confusion. So here, the challenge is, do you establish an identity or do you have role confusion? That's the challenge. And if you're lucky, you have identity because this identity will also help you with the next stage of development. So now let's look real quickly at uh, psychosocial stages of development per Eric Erickson. Now, we've talked about a few of these already. All right, uh, for example, we did trust versus mistrust when we talked about uh, uh, attachment styles. Remember, the idea was uh, in your infancy stage from zero to one year, if you are a kid and you cry and uh, all of a sudden you are getting cared for by your caretaker, then you develop a sense of trust in the world. Now, that kid who has developed a sense of trust in the world, when they are in that strange situation scenario that Mary Ainsworth developed, meaning that the mom gets up in this strange room and then leaves you, you have trust that she's gonna be coming back. The other kid who developed a sense of mistrust in the world because their caretakers did not uh, readily come to their aid when they cried and they needed them for something, when mother leaves them, they're the ones who are more likely to respond in a very negative way. They're going to cry or get really cold or resentful because they don't necessarily trust the mother as someone who developed this as a trust might have. So that's the basic idea there. Now, a couple of other stages, we have toddlerhood from one to three years old. And this includes the terrible twos. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Here, the issue is one of autonomy versus shame and doubt. Toddlers learn to exercise their will and do things for themselves or they doubt their abilities. So it is not unusual for a two-year-old in this particular stage of development, as you're trying to help them do something, they'll say, stop, stop, I can do it, okay? What they're trying to do is exercise their autonomy, their ability to control things. Because the other choice would be if they don't solve that particular issue in the right way, is they'll have shame and doubt in those abilities. Then we have preschool from three to six years old. It's initiative versus guilt. Uh, elementary school, competence versus inferiority. And then the adolescence that we've talked about here, identity versus role confusion. Again, during this stage, teenagers work at redefining a sense of self by testing roles and then integrating them to form a single identity or they become confused about who they are. Now, you, I'm sure you've heard of this before. It's uh, something that you hear quite often. You can't really have a serious, successful relationship unless you know who you are. Okay, well, adolescence is the time when you get to learn who you are. And then, then when you get to the next stage of development, which is young adulthood, that's going to be the stage of intimacy versus isolation. This is the stage where people will establish, young adults will establish close relationships and gain the capacity for intimate love or they'll feel socially isolated. So again, you can see how important it is for us to obtain our true identity in adolescence so that it prepares us for intimacy and in young adulthood. Okay, let me see if I can get this thing erased up here. Uh, all right, there you go. All right, so the other topic we wanna to cover is gonna be peer influence. Now, one of the things that we need to understand too is that when you are really young, uh, when you're in the childhood stage, uh, your parents do control a lot about who your peers are because they can arrange play dates for you. They can do all sorts of things, okay, so they can control. But as you get older, especially when you get into adolescence, you have a lot more freedom. You get to choose who you're going to be hanging out with. So the degree of peer influence is hard to trace, but apparent conformity uh, could be a selection effect. Okay, they get together because they want to be with people who are like them. So if you hang out with smokers, you could be with smokers simply because you want to be like them or you want to hang out with smokers because they're like you. So it's hard to see which way it's going to go, but peer influence is something that is significant. So interaction with peers can teach us new social skills. 
parents may try to have indirect influence by selecting child's peers, selecting the school or the neighborhood, but ultimately most children, young people, will self-select their peers. So our parents, uh, especially even when we're young, do not choose our friends for us. We choose them ourselves. Now, obviously, one of the challenges that parents have to deal with uh, is the fact that uh, we do see that, to a large extent, the relationships between uh, parent and children change over time. So during adolescence, peer relationships take the center stage. Conflicts arise in this stage, especially with firstborn children. The challenge, finding how adolescents relationships with peers and with parents can coexist well rather than being in conflict. So if we look over here, the, the graph that we have displayed here, this shows the percentage with positive, warm interaction with parents. You can see two to four year old parents love them because there's a lots of positive, warm interaction with parents, but increasingly as the years increase, as they get older, those interactions go down and down and down. And so by the time you're nine or 11 years old, you have a lot more self-directed interaction with your peers. You control your agenda. You're controlling a little bit more of who you're hanging out with. And we start to see a shift from parents to peers and how you interact and hang out with them as opposed to parents. Now, there's gonna be some degree of, uh, of, of difference with regard to how young people are going to be influenced by parents or by their peers. And this is what the research shows us. Parents still have more influence on the following areas, education, career, cooperation, your level of self-discipline, responsibility, your charitableness, how, how often you give to other people, your religion background, and, and style of interaction with authority figures. Whereas peers have more influence on learning cooperation skills, path to popularity, choice of music and other recreation, choice of clothing and other cultural choices, and good and bad habits. I'm gonna pause there to see if you guys have any agree or disagreement with this. You can send me a via chat message if you agree with what this chart is telling us or not. So we have one agreement, some for parts of it. Uh, any more? Come on, give me some feedback here. Are you buying into this or not? So basically what this is saying is when it comes to social things, entertainment, social things, and interacting with others, peers have a great deal more influence. When it comes to things dealing more with, with money, okay, uh, and things like your self-discipline and cooperation, it seems that the parents may have a lot more influence. So that's where we are when it comes to those particular ideas about how children and adolescents may be greatly influenced by their parents. So we don't totally disregard, disregard uh, how our parents role is in our life they still have a significant role in our life and for the most part uh, someone asked is this going to be worldwide evaluation or predominantly based u.s i would have to say most likely it's going to be western societies like the u.s household most likely okay other cultures may be much different you got to understand too we are a very individualistic culture uh and we the research does say that we do support our, our elderly parents well, uh, but we have a different degree of re different types of respect for them compared to other cultures who, who may revere them a lot more than we revere our elderly parents here. So there are gonna be differences definitely uh, based on what type of society that we are talking about. So that gives us some idea about parents and peers. Now, the other thing that we talk about here as well uh, is going to be a look at the three types of development. So this is gonna be like a couple of slides here, just cover some of the things that we've talked about thus far. So the stages in continuity, uh, three different types of development we've talked about so far. We've talked about cognitive development, moral development, and now psychosocial development. 
okay? And they can sort of be seen as running in parallel with each other. Are they really separate stages or a continuous process of development? So if we overlap them, we can see how they seem to sort of overlap to a degree. At the very top, we have the pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional morality of Lawrence Kohlberg. We have Eric Erickson's psychosocial stages of development. And then we have Jean Piaget's cognitive development. And we can see some of the things that may have some degree of overlap, uh, not necessarily all, all, all the way through it, obviously, but the idea is that we can see this sort of like on a continuum. And that's one of the questions that we asked at the very beginning of this chapter about, is this a lifelong continuous process or is it more stages? Okay, right now we mostly see a lot deal with uh, conti continuation or stages depending on what aspect we're looking at. For example, researchers who see development as a function of experience tend to see development as a continuous and gradual. So if you look more at experience, function of experience, we think nurture and we see it as continuous, gradual and ongoing. Researcher who focus on biological maturation see spurts of growth and other changes that make one stage of development very different from another. So nature has stages. So one idea that has been proposed is again, nurture is continuous and nature has stages. So that is gonna be one way that we can sort of look at this to sort of help coordinate all this type of stuff in your minds and in your memory as you try to learn this material. Now let's talk about emerging adulthood and adulthood. So what is this emerging adulthood nonsense, huh? So emerging adulthood. In some countries, added years of education and later marriage has delayed full adult independence beyond traditional adolescence. Remember how we're sort of defining adulthood is independence, being able to exist and function without the aid of others, all right? So you're not living in someone's house. They're not paying bills for you. You're independent. So this seems to have created a new phase which can be called emerging adulthood. And what they've done is they sort of establish the age range for this young ad uh, emerging adulthood as between 18 to 25 years old. So it's sort of cutting uh, people some slack to a degree saying they're emerging adults, meaning that they have certain functions within their life, which are very adult-like, but they're not totally, totally independent yet. Now let's look at the, the graph at the bottom here and discuss real briefly what these things actually mean. So one of the things that we see is that there has been changes in how things appear in the world for a variety of reasons. One, if we look at 1890 women, okay, the start of the rock or the first peer that they have happens at around age, let's see, 11, 12, 13, around 15, a little bit before 15 years old was when the first period would start in females. And then a short seven years after that, on average, they would be married. So around the age 23, they'd be married. So 15 or so, they start their period. Around 23, they're married. Seven year interval between first period and marriage. Then we go about 100 years into the future, 1995, okay? We see that now, uh, as societies who are very healthy and well, well fed usually demonstrate, the first period has gone down in age. So now, we're seeing it start as 11, 12, a little bit before 13 years of age, the first period can start, and we're seeing it even younger these days, will start, and then it's gonna be a whopping almost 12 to 13 years later before they get married. So here we're talking about, let's say it's 21, 22, 23, 24, around 25 years of age before they get married. Now, what's happening? Why is all this happening this way? Anyone have any ideas? Why the delay in getting married? Think about it. Where are you guys right now? Education, thank you, Diane. Okay, the idea is education. Uh, we have seen education as being a key thing that 
we've been uh, talking about with our kids for generation after generation, you need to get an education, you need to get an education, you need to get a degree uh, to look for your long-term career. Now, as more and more people did that, but particular females, as more and more females did that, they would delay their childbearing years. Heck, they would even delay marriage. Okay, so marriage is being delayed and even childbearing is gonna be delayed. So now we see people who are getting married closer to around 30 and usually having babies around that time too. Now, not to say that people don't have it much younger, that, that is true, but I'm saying that for, for a portion of the population, these things are gonna be put on the back burner until they get their education and their career going and all this type of stuff. And that has changed a lot of things. Uh, and we'll see how that changes things uh, in future chapters as well. But this sort of sets the stage for what we see as this emerging adulthood. So now let's look at adulthood. So adulthood, here's some of the topics that grown-ups think about. Physical changes, it's just going to have to happen. Uh, sensory changes, uh, dementias, including uh, Alzheimer's disease. I'll make this note now. I don't have the slides to cover this, but dementias and Alzheimer's disease, these are things which are not naturally part of the aging process. It's a disease, okay? Uh, so what we're saying is that we will have some uh, deficiencies coming into our life as we age, but these are diseases, and so we don't see this as a normal part of the aging process. So we'll see cognitive development and decline, social development, love and work, uh, well-being across the lifespan, and then dying and death. So looking back now, uh, at the Eric Erickson stages of social psychosocial development, we have seen young adulthood, and we'll see that in the next slide coming up. Next couple slides coming up. Young adulthood is going to be at your height of physical capability, okay? It's your intimacy versus isolation. Then you'll go into middle adulthood, where it's going to be about generativity and versus stagnation. And then late adulthood is going to be about integrity versus despair. So intimacy versus isolation, we know what that is. Generativity versus stagnation is this. How do you give back to the world? Generativity is that idea of giving back to the world in some way. Most people do this by raising a good family, raising children. Many will do this by uh, being a contributing members to the workforce, by giving back, by working well. And then we have late adulthood, integrity versus despair. Here, you're sort of like reflecting back on your life's work, what your life was like, okay? And then you can have a sense of integrity that you did what you needed to do and you accomplished it well, or a sense of despair if you don't feel like you did what you needed to do and you were seen sort of as a failure. So those are the things that we see uh, during the adult years from Eric Erickson's point of view. So let's look at some of these other aspects. So adulthood is the rest of the developmental story just uh, one long plateau of work and possibly raising kids. Well, we see that physical development, physical decline, lifespan and death are gonna be sensory changes, memory issues, and then you'll have more commitments. Uh, commitments change as you age and mature. When you're really young, uh, a late adolescent and then young adult, you'll see the world totally differently than when you become middle aged or later in your adulthood. Uh, things and priorities change drastically and you see the world in a totally different, different light. So here we're talking about adult physical development for the young adulthood. In our mid twenties, we reach a peak in natural physical abilities, which come with biological maturation. Muscular strength is at its peak. Cardiac output, our reaction time is probably the best it will be. Sensory sensitivity, to what extent can training overcome the decline that falls? So when you're in your young adulthood, okay, where many of you may be now, that's gonna be normally the peak for most of these factors, okay? Uh, teenage, young adulthood, and then after your, your young adulthood, it will start to decline somewhat. So let's look at some of these declines, these naturally occurring uh, uh, downgrading of our capabilities. So physical changes in middle adulthood. And middle adulthood, we're talking about 40s to 60s here, okay? It's generativity versus stagnation is what Eric Erickson sees it as. So 
between 40 and 60, physical vitality such as endurance and strength may still be more of a function of lifestyle than a biological decline. Let me give you an example. You could have a 50-year-old ex-Marine that is in great shape, better shape than a 23-year-old potentially, okay? If they kept up their strength, kept up their, their physical exercise all the time. So it's going to be a great deal of impact based on your lifestyle, not necessarily biological decline. So you still have capability, even in middle adulthood, especially if you have a long tradition of maintaining proper diet, eating behavior, as well as uh, exercise. So some changes are still driven by genetic maturation, especially the end of our reproductive years. So the end of reproductive years, uh, there is a gradual decline in sexual activity in adulthood. Although sexuality can continue throughout life, there's not going to be the same rush and drive that you probably experienced when you were much younger. Around age 50, women enter menopause, the end of being able to get pregnant. Uh, according to evolutionary psychologists, why might it make sense for women's fertility to end at around this age? Any ideas? Well, think about it. Okay, I hear somebody. I was just, I was just going to say, I think that as women age, um, there's a detriment to their health and well-being if they carry the child. That is correct. And so we see not only a detriment to the, the, the mother potentially, but also for the child. There's gonna be a greater risk for some abnormalities that the older you get and you start bearing children. So obviously one of the things is trying to, and that's the way the evolution thing sort of worked. It tries to maximize offspring and maximize the health and survivability of the offspring. And so if you're wanting to get pregnant and you're much older than the norm, then there's probably going to be a greater likelihood of some challenges and some potential issues with that offspring. So we see this as probably being a, a, a safety guard, so to speak, uh, for the whole uh, reproductive uh, uh, establishment of a particular species. All right. So so now we see, we've seen young adulthood, middle adulthood, and saw some of the challenges there. Now we see this aging body. I want to talk real briefly here about the aging body to bring up some concepts and some ideas real quickly. First, potential lifespan for the human body has been estimated to be around 122 years. Okay, so they say that we have the capability of living 122 years. Now, for a whole variety of reasons, we see most people do not get anywhere close to that, but that is what they say a potential lifespan could be for a human. Life expectancy refers to the average expected lifespan. So here are some numbers. The worldwide average, think about this, the worldwide average has increased from 49 years in 1950. That was your lifespan, was 49 years old in 1950 to 69 in 2010. In 2012, we have some numbers here from the research done in 2012. We see South Africa 49, Cameroon 55, Pakistan 66. We put uh, Japan 84, United States at 75. Can anyone see or know what some of the differences may be? Why do we see these different variety of ages uh, for a, a life expectancy for these different populations. Why is, is Japan so high relative to, let's say, even the United States? Almost 10 points different. Any ideas? Culture and lifestyle. Culture and lifestyle, which also will have a great deal of impact on diet. What do we primarily eat? Okay, so, so we see there's a lot of factors that go into these numbers, okay, and these numbers are significant, these differences, but again, the diet uh, that we see in the United States may be a great deal different than the diet we see in other countries like Japan, okay, where a great deal of a lot of their food will be uh, fish, okay, whereas we don't see fish as eaten as often here as part of the staple uh, for our particular culture. Now, more aged women. The rise in life expectancy combined with declining birth rates means a higher percentage of the world's population is old, okay? And we've seen this for a while now where uh, we don't have enough young people being born to prop up things like social security the way we had hoped uh, generations ago, 
So now we don't have as many people working for all the people who are gonna be on social security because the world is getting older. More elderly people are women because more men die than women at every age. By age 100, women outnumber men by a ratio of five to one. So if we look at any nursing home, you go to any nursing home, most likely when you go to the nursing home, you'll see more females at a nursing home than you will men. Because by the time they get to the nursing home, most of the men or a majority of men would have possibly died out from those particular cohorts because women tend to outlive men uh, more so. so. So we see there's gonna be this discrepancy when we get to the higher end of late adulthood, who's still gonna be around? It's mostly gonna be women still around as opposed to men. So why don't we live forever? There are very possible biological answers. We have nurture environment and accumulation of stress, damage and disease wears us down until one of those factors kills us. Okay, we have to note that uh, right now there's probably loads of stress going around the entirety of the world with this pandemic. People are just stressed. I'm sure you guys have experienced it yourself. Okay, uh, stress, all sorts of things is just really aggravating people. And we don't cover it in this particular semester, but uh, you can preview, uh, scan the chapter on stress uh, in your textbook. Uh, what it comes down to is stress causes damage. It weakens your immune system, making it more likely that you'll catch a virus or a bug or something of that nature, which will lessen your, your survivability. So the idea is that nurture and environment, stress in particular can play a, a major role. Gene, some people have genes that protect against some kinds of damage and not others. And then we have, uh, even with great genes and environment, we have the telomeres. Uh, these are the things at the tips of our chromosome. Now, you may not realize this. I hate to be the one to tell you if you hadn't realized this, but you are not who you were when you were born. You don't have the same cells. You've been copied numerous times by now, whatever age you're group now, you're probably uh, early 20s most likely or, or older. So you are copies of what you were originally. And each time you have copies made, the telomeres uh, will start to wear down. And when they start to wear down, the copies are not gonna be as, as efficient or as effective. So, so you're not getting the best copies. And so as the telomeres wear down, copies are not going to be as efficient, as effective as they once were. And then we start to see the process of aging start to happen. And so we just run down that way. So telomeres sort of give us really the, the length of how many fresh copies of ourselves that we can actually make. So the idea here, there are many factors as to why it is that we don't live forever. One of the, the key ones is gonna be our chromosomes. Uh, the telomeres is gonna make some sort of limit on how, how long we can be on this planet. Now, uh, as we start to talk about a few things uh, dealing with later life, uh, one of the things dealing with later life is gonna be the possibility of death, all right? Now, there's this phenomenon that they refer to as the death deferral phenomenon. And basically, it's when people hang on for an important date or an important holiday, like they hang on for their birthday or they hang on for Christmas. And this graph sort of, uh, sort of lays it out for us here. Can people will themselves to hold off death? There is some evidence that some people are able to stay alive to be with families at Christmas time. So if you look at this chart, we can see the daily deaths in the United States. And what you see here is that it dips on Christmas Day. So we have less deaths, at least deaths reported here on Christmas Day. And then as we move to the next day, there's a sharp increase. So it's as if they held on until the last minute they went and they had that one last Christmas holiday and then they allowed themselves to move on. So death deferral. So the idea is that we do seem to have some sort of control, this is what this tends to suggest, to defer something like that. I don't wanna ask you guys, but I'm sure some people have seen things of that nature where a family member or someone may be seemingly hang on for an important date or holiday or something. And then shortly after that day has passed or that holiday is over, uh, then they, they die. Uh, so this is not an unusual thing. It's common enough that we have this death deferral phenomenon in place about it. So when it comes to physical changes with age, uh, as we get really to the later years of life, we see these things happen. The following abilities decline as we age. 
Uh, we see visual acuity, both sharpness and brightness also decrease. Hearing, especially uh, sensing higher pitch noises. Reaction time and other general motor abilities become more problematic. Neural processing speed, especially for complex and new novel tasks are more problematic as well. So we see physical changes, mental changes. It is the normal expectation that these things happen. All right, so obviously uh, you may have had perfect vision when you were younger, but then your eyesight goes away and then you have to hold the book a mile away with your arms to read something on the book. Again, you may laugh at this, but eventually uh, those of you who are really young may get to that point too, because this is the normal types of changes that we experience uh, with aging. Now, there are a couple of things too, which can be bad and good news. Uh, one of them deals with the bad news. Uh, the immune system declines with age. So our immune system is not going to be as effective as it once was and can have difficulty fighting off major illness. Okay, so major illness, bad for old folks. Okay, but the good news is the immune system has a lifetime's accumulation of antibodies and does well fighting off minor illnesses. Because if you've been around for 60 plus years compared to someone who's been around only for 20 years or so, you, the 60 year old, have a lot more immunities and a lot more antibodies in your body because you've seen all sorts of things come your way and you've developed these antibodies, these ways to fight them. So for minor illnesses and flus and things of that nature, you can probably fight them off because you have all those immunities in your system. Someone who's younger, they're not gonna be so lucky because their body may not have ever seen those things before and they can be so, sort of like in a bad place. So we do see a bad news, good news scenario here when it comes to age and immunity. So a couple of things here. We see that when it comes to slowing the aging process, there are a few things that seem to uh, pop up as a way to do so. Uh, exercise being one of the key ones here. Exercise can build muscles and bones, stimulate neurogenesis, maintain telomeres, improve cognition, reduce the risk of dementia. So as is the case normally when it comes to uh, exercising like your doctor always tells you, you should do more of, uh, they're right, okay? By doing this type of stuff for longer periods in your life, you're sort of paying the bill now for many, many years in the future so you can be healthier as an older person. Now, there are gonna be changes in the brain with age, uh, myelin enhanced neural processing speeds, peaks in the teen years and declines thereafter. Uh, regions of the brain related to memory began to shrink with age, making it harder to form new memories. The frontal lobes atrophy leading eventually to decreased inhibition and self-control. By 80, a healthy brain is probably 5% lighter than the brain was in middle adulthood. So you've lost some brain. Now, one thing I, I'll, I'll point out as I normally do during this time is that Thanksgiving dinners can be very stressful sometimes. You get all the different generations together. If you have a 13-year-old female, for example, and an 83-year-old uh, grandpa uh, at the same house at the same t uh, dinner table, uh, both of them may say some crazy stuff because grandpa's brain is starting to decrease in weight and size in certain areas. So his inhibitions are gone. First of all, he's old now, so he has le less to fear. So he can say whatever's on his mind. And the teenage girl, well, her, full, her frontal lobe has not fully developed yet. So she's more likely to say what's on her mind. So you can have some very interesting th Thanksgiving conversations there. But we do see these changes in the brain with age. They are going to happen. Uh, a couple other things as we sort of wrap things up here. Even without brain change of dementia, there are some changes of our ability to learn, process, recall information. Here you can see the graph to the left here. Uh, after three introductions, we can see uh, that older age groups have poor performance. So 18 to 39 year olds can remember almost close to 90% after three introductions, whereas 70 to 90 year olds, they can remember slightly more than 40% of the names after three introductions. And we see the common thing there. Now, when it comes to number of words remembered, uh, we can see the number of words recognized is stable with age. So your recognition system really doesn't change over age. So you can remember certain types of things when you're 20, also at 30, 40, 50, and 60. So the idea is that your recognition systems are there, but being able to generate and recall things that has declined. That's what this chart on the right shows us. The red line up top, stability, 
with being able to recognize words. And the one at the bottom, the green line that sort of goes down, tilts down, the number of words recalled declines with age. So being able to generate, recall those words are gonna be somewhat problematic. All right, uh, let me sort of wrap things up here real quickly here. There's a few slides that I want to get through. Uh, there are certain ideas that you can learn more learning and memory changes with rote memorization, ability to decline uh, more than ability to learn meaningful information, uh, those types of things. Uh, compared to young and old, this gets back to some of our conversation on research uh, in the first chapter of this course. Uh, Cross-sectional studies compare people at different ages all at one time. If you're interested in how people change and develop from 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 years old, you could do one thing. You could do a cross-sectional study. You get the groups of individuals, okay, at those ages now and study them. The idea, though, is that you are believing that uh, someone who is 40 and someone who is 20, uh, they're going to be compared the same way if you did a longitudinal study. It's not necessarily so, because if you have somebody who is, uh, let's say, 80 years old, like the, you have here, 80-year-olds were raised in a different era, okay, a different generation. If you did it as a longitudinal, I mean, as you did it as a, a cross-sectional study, so an 80-year-old was born 80 years ago. Okay, if you do it someone who's 20 years old, they're a totally different generation, and so it's going to be hard to compare using cross-sectional studies. Or you could do a longitudinal study. That means you wait till someone ages. You wait till the 20-year-old become an 80-year-old. Now, obviously, there's some disadvantages to that. You have to wait a lot of years, and there's going to be a lot of attrition. Okay, so those are going to be very difficult things to do when it comes to studying developmental psychology. Uh, last couple of things I want to cover here uh, is going to be dealing with social development and adulthood. Uh, one idea I should have covered earlier a little bit. Uh, here, uh, is adult social development driven by a biological maturation or by life experiences and roles? You've heard of the midlife crisis before, I'm sure. This is when you have a reevaluation, one's life plan and success does not seem to peak at any particular age. For 25% of the adults who do have this emotional crisis, the trigger seems to be some sort of major life change or, or situation, like a major illness, a divorce, a job loss, or parenting. Then you start questioning where you are. Do you still have the same vitality you did when you were 25 years old or younger? And so this may necessitate you buying a sports car or even having an extramarital affair. Whatever the case may be, it's you trying to relive or recapture some of that energy of your youth because you are sort of like in a crisis mode. Now, when it comes to psychosocial development, uh, what we see is the following. Although midlife crisis may not be a function of age, people do feel pressured by a social clock of achievement and expectation. Uh, we know, for example, when we have, when we're in our 20s, it's about you establishing a relationship to a large degree. You, you, you know that you're out of college, you have your career, they say, okay, now it's time for you to find that special someone. When you're in middle adult, adulthood, the idea is that you should be giving back to the world, either by raising a family or by having some sort of significant work. So the idea here is that each one of these things that we're talking about has sort of like a social clock to it. Now, once you graduate from high school, college. Once college, uh, you, you get job. Once job, you get married. Once you're married, you have a family. And we so have these expectations, and these expectations are sort of like the social clock that guides all our behavior to some extent. And when we don't meet the expectations of the social clock, that's when sometimes we can start to question ourselves to some, some extent. All right, uh, last couple of things here. Uh, I won't read these here, but the idea is that we can do and achieve a lot by having and demonstrating certain types of commitment, uh, commitment to love, our relationships with our family members, our significant others, or commitment to work. Particularly in the United States, is one way that we sort of identify ourselves is with our work. Uh, we, we, we see that as very important to who we are. And that's why it can be very difficult at times when someone is getting close to retirement age, they've been with a certain organization for 30, 40 years, and now they have to retire all of a sudden, it can be a really shock to them. If anyone has ever seen someone go through retirement, some people do not do retirement well at all because their, their whole identity is wrapped up 
in their career, in their works, how they see themselves as being fit and, and, and a provider to the world in a sense. Now, one thing I wanna make sure we understand too is satisfaction uh, with your life to a degree, your well-being uh, is something that can be seen as somewhat stable as this sort of indicates. So look at here, we see these different age groups, okay, and saying basically your life today, worst or best life that you have, and it's very stable. So it should be noted that this stability is not something that's unusual idea, uh, that this is something that is a very powerful idea that we'll see in the next slide here, the next couple of slides here. Uh, so the idea here is that older people, they sometimes seem to be happier to a degree. Uh, older people feel an increased sense of competence and control and have a greater stability and mood as well as they focus a lot more on the positive experiences in their life as opposed to the negative ones. Uh, we do see there are plenty, many factors that lead to successful aging uh, that you can see from the biopsychosocial factors that we've talked about several times as well. One thing I wanna end up here with is this slide here on death and dying. Uh, so we have uh, a bad situation here, someone's spouse dies, okay, an older person's spouse dies, that's year zero, and so you see they're at their lowest life satisfaction there. But what happens two, three, four, five years after the death of their spouse? Where's their life satisfaction located now? Anyone? What does it do? It it rebounds. It rebounds. And that's the thing I want to share with you. It does definitely rebound. So the idea here, and we'll see this notion pop up again. Uh, there is this notion of something called a set point, meaning that uh, once you have something like, uh, let's say somebody wins a lottery. Okay, you win, let's say $100 million. That'd be cool. Their satisfaction peaks. But guess what will happen eventually? Three, four years out, their satisfaction level will get back down to where it normally is. So it always rebounds. So that's the key idea that I want to share with you here is that this notion is that to a large extent, uh, we have this place where we normally are when it comes to satisfaction. Something really bad can happen or something really good can happen. We normally bounce back to what our average is. So we're not going to be always too high or too low. So even though it may be miserable for, for a while, you will rebound eventually to get back to your normal level of life satisfaction. That's what the research shows us about a variety of factors out there. Okay, and finally, when it comes to death and dying, uh, individual responses to death may vary. Uh, grief is more intense when death occurs really unexpectedly, especially if also too early on the social clock. Remember, that social clock does dictate when we should expect things. If it happens too soon on that social clock, it's even much more uh, debilitating in a sense and more intense for us when that happens. And there is no, I repeat, no standard pattern or length of the grieving process is gonna be different for lots of people. It seems to help to have the support of friends or groups and to face the reality of death and grief while affirming the value of life. And one of the things that that previous slide should demonstrate that even though you may be really particularly down at one point, you will tend to rebound after some time. Give it a year or two, you will feel a little bit more like you did before uh, that bad incident did occur. All right, that's it for today. Are there any questions or comments you guys have for so far? All right, the next topic I think we'll be talking about when we get back here uh, next week will be uh, sex, gender, and sexuality, chapter five. Okay, if there's nothing else, you guys are free to get out of here, and I'll talk to you guys later.